you talking and not, you never heard the interviewer, mm -hmm. which I, I think is a nice way to do it. But, and, but also, I would like to start with some, a little bit about your background, um, how you got interested in painting. You said that you started painting as a, as a young child or drawing as a young child. I also read the biography that you sent. Hmm. Um, and I was interested in the, in the Cape interview that you said you used to go to the MFA when you were a young boy and look at the paintings, which seemed to me highly unusual that a well, young child would do that. Well, a young child being 10, 10, 11, and 12. That's pretty young for him. Well, like, we lived in West Roxbury. Mm -hmm. The Museum of Fine Arts was a choo choo, I mean, a MTA ride in. You go to the Arbor Way, and then from Arbor Way, you take the Huntington Avenue, and there you were. And it was no big deal. But it was wonderful because you go in there, and you know, no one was telling you what to see. And you went in, and you saw that which struck you. And you could dwell as long as you chose on it. There was never any sense of, oh, here comes a whole bunch of German tourists coming through. You had to get out of the way, you've got to be run over. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing, which you have in Europe all the time, as you know, probably. And uh, it was kind of laid back and quite wonderful. You would go by but yourself? I'd go by myself, yes. There was a friend of mine, Irving Bolden, and I haven't thought of him in years, who lived in Hyde Park, who would also was, I knew him reasonably well. Uh, when we were quite young. I, I'd forgotten how I knew him, but at any rate. Well, essentially, I went by myself, and my parents, I wanted to do it. My parents never pushed me in any direction, but they paid the bills, let me put it that way, and that was a great help. Mm -hmm. um, and so I studied at, at the museum also in that, roughly in that period of time, <laughs> with a, a gal named Miss Cook and one named Miss Lord. And there was a wonderful teacher there whom I did not study with, who was legend at the time in, in the museum. This is when they had a whole court of plastic casts that you could draw from. A whole court on the first floor of plastic casts. Miss Lebrec, I mean, Miss Lebrec was had a strident kind of voice when she taught them how to say and how to draw. And the anatomy was absolutely perfect. And she was legend for being so on the ball as a teacher. So I, I lasted there a couple of years, and then came high school, so I went to the Mass College of Art and studied there on their Saturday program. And then finally high school was over, and I decided to go to the best, I wanted to go to Mass Art, but Mass Art was closed at that time, it was during the war. And they didn't have enough students to keep it open. So I went to Vesper George School of Art, which I'm delighted I did do, because I think the training there, particularly the first year, was superb. But then I went into the United States Marine Corps for a couple of years. And be because I went in the Corps when everyone was getting out, the real Marines were getting out, it meant that we were given jobs, the like of which we had no we were not really equipped to do, but hey, better to have somebody than nobody. So I was sent up to Washington, D.C., where I wrote a course in commercial art for the Marine Corps Institute, MCI. It's like international correspondence schools, but we had our own. And it was right at 8th and I Street Southeast in Washington, which is where the Commandant is, and so forth and so on. So it was a lot of spit and polish, which I like. I enjoy spit and polish. I like being in dress blues as much of, as other times I possibly could be. And we'd be in the White House when Truman was president, and once a month or so for just a social thing, I was representing the Corps as a non-commissioned officer, drinking martinis, so forth. Meeting the president? Oh yeah, the, yeah, Harry Truman was right there. I mean, it was 18 years old, what the hell? That's great experience. And you, at 18, you take it all for granted. But I used to do the multigrith, multi, multilith, multigraph process of, of printing, which meant I would design courses, not design courses, advertise courses that needed a little push. And there were 600 posts at the time in the Marine Corps. And then I'd do the copy as a rule because the, the captain couldn't, well, he was not educated. Not that I was, but again, a little is better than none. And I'd write the copy for it, do the illustrations on these plates, paper plates, 
and even got into four color work. And we had our own printing plant in Washington too. So I would follow through, do the artwork, the copy, go through the printer, and then see them distributed, you know, the mailing room distributed them. So I had a sense of the whole process of advertising in a small, concise way. And I decided, hey, I didn't want to spend a life doing this goddamn thing. But it was fascinating just the same. And that was kind of important. I mean, all things and we all experience in life add, I think, to our decision making about what next are you going to do. And I, I, I think that was a wonderful experience because it meant that, well, to begin with, I stuttered badly when I was a child. I think I told you this. And I had what is called then, when you're a youngster, elocution. Now it's called speech pathology, I believe. And so I had to speak in front of people. I had to remember the poems and that sort of thing. You know, there'd be this recital and you'd have to get up and, and recite whatever it was. I mean, one of them was, uh, the hell was that? Abu Ben Adam, may his tribe increase, awoke one night from a deep dream of peace and saw within the moonlight of his room, making it rich and like a lily, and blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> and this kind of thing I consider valuable to me. In first place, I was able to control mostly the stuttering. And you are comfortable. Very comfortable. To stay speaking in front of groups. So those things, yes. Um, just one small thing. If you can actually address Gene more than you're addressing. Oh, all right, sorry. All right, okay, gladly. I'll keep my eyes on Gene. Not here. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you can do it as animated as you want. <laughs> and. Uh, no, I consider that was, was a very valuable experience. You know, that was, goes back to probably age 12 to 14 in that area. They had spent a couple of years doing that. <laughs> um, but then I came back from the Marine Corps and went back to Vesper George to complete my training there. And I stayed for an extra year painting pictures in the Museum of Fine Arts, one of which you saw that Durga, for instance, that was hanging in the corridor. That was painted when I was about 18 or 19, 19 probably. And many other things. I did a lot of melees. Because melee is a wonderful artist, as you know. But it's only when you get to try and do a assimilator copy, not that you're trying to follow necessarily the procedure that he had used, but you're trying to assimilate the effect that he got, doing it more or less a la prima. I never, for instance, went in for Rubens. I know, it didn't interest me. That whole th idea of doing underpaintings and glazing and grisailles and, and, and then glazing and all that. Uh, I didn't know enough to do it. And it didn't interest me. I was impatient. I'm terribly impatient about that. I wanted to get the look of it. I do Rembrandt's. And then there was a, remember St. John the Divine, that picture there, I think it's no longer called by Rembrandt, but School of. That was one I painted. And, uh, it was just at that time they, they entering the collection was the, the two male and female portraits that were painted in his somewhat early middle period that are still in the museum with, uh, in ovals. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, who was? Oh, I did a, well, Mille, I, I've mentioned already. Uh, but, and there, it was. <laughs> I remember several of the, of the Impressionist painted, paintings I did. You may remember the Sicily, you know, the Sicily's work. There's that water coming in, and it's, it's a well-known Sicily. I don't recall the title of it. But I painted that because I was, and Jim Pa, James Wingate Pa, who was a teacher of mine at Vesper George, wanted it. And I said, okay, then you give me one of your watercolors or a painting of yours. Well, it never happened. He ne I never did get it, but he got mine, sort of. Uh, and I've often, Jim unfortunately died in Provincetown in 1949. He was killed, actually. He was murdered. But he was a great teacher and a wonderful painter. And he had some personal problems, obviously, that got into his way of leading a more effective life. But uh, I'm still looking for a James Wingate Park to give them to the Cape Museum of Fine Arts. If I can find one for the right price, or if somebody can lead me in the direction where I can con somebody out of it so that they can give it to the museum, 
because you can take a complete tax deduction, you know, if you didn't do it. If you give it, and I know I can get it appraised fairly and accurately for the top price. So that can affect sometimes somebody's, somebody's final um, uh, tax situation at the end of that current year. So, I mean, is that, that the way my mind works? Yeah, that's another way in which my mind works. <laughs> but why not? Because the Cape Museum is an interesting place. We were set up so that we are displaying the work of people who work for some significant portion of their life on Cape Cod. Mostly for the through the, from the tw early 20th century on, or the very late 19th century on. And there are an awful lot of people. I personally have given probably 25 or 26 paintings of my own, for my own collection of people who had worked on the Cape in the, in, during that period of time. And others have, have done the same. And our collection so far of 1,500 works have come from donation. Because like any new museum, the money goes into the bricks and mortar. And it's fair, relatively easy to get the bricks and mortar. But it's not so easy to get them to contribute money for an acquisitions fund. Plus the fact, if you people know that there's an acquisitions fund, can you imagine what the hell's going to go on with some of the living painters? It's going to be a struggle to find out who, who gets what. And I would rather see living painters contribute what, that which they can do and no one else can, their work and let other people who have deep pockets contribute thousands of dollars for other purposes. Anyway, that's just my own view on this. Because the one thing we as painters can do that no one else really can do unless they are collectors as such. And it gives people an opportunity to give again, you see. Which I think is well, it's an opportunity. And it's a very good opportunity, even though up until now, in the last 35 years, you can't take it as a tax consideration, as you know. Whereas you can if you give somebody else's work. Right. <coughs> Have so I gotten away Cape from it? began with Henry Henschen? Say that again? Your ties to the Cape began when you... Began with Henry. I'd never been to the Cape. My parents had always gone to, the, to New Hampshire in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And the uh, first time I went to the Cape, uh, I was just fascinated by it. Gosh. I remember vividly going down, well, first couple of times to meet Henry Henshey, to hear about what it's all about and what he teaches and tends to teach during the summer. Then I went down with four other guys, three other guys who were students at Vesper George, who had, were in the same essential boat that I was in. And we rented a place together, Arnold's Hardware Store, in the, right downtown in, in P-Town. And uh, I went up to see Henry that afternoon and, and got boards and panels and paints and so forth. And as I was coming down the street, they said, you can't go down there, boy. And I said, why not? There's a big fire down there. I said, what do you mean a big fire? I said, Arnold's Hardware Store is burning down. <laughs> I had earlier in the morning put all my crap up into the third floor where we had rented a place for the summer. Gonzo. I went up the ladder after the fire was out, looked down, you know, boom, it was just completely gone. So that was my introduction to P-Town. Oh, it was. And I was wondering if that is, you know, is this a sign? <laughs> I said, shit, no, it's not a sign. So I, I went back after painting the walls of Vesper George School of Art for a month and a half or so. I went down the 1st of July and would, went back to P-Town for 32 years. Never wanting to buy, because being 120 miles away from, and having had that fire experience, and knowing in September of that year that Carl Murchison's Spanish villa burned down at the west end of town. And it was set by some, you know, kids in town. It was, it was proven to be so. And I thought, oh, uh, it's, you're just too far away. So I kept running. But you know, when I was renting this studio from Henry Henshey, which was a beautiful studio with North Light, with a cottage buttoned onto it, and it was quite simple, but you know, big enough, it was $300 a year. Three to $400 a year 
in the earlier days, you know. And that was, hey, that was nothing. So know. I'd be far better than I didn't have to worry about turning off the water, blah, 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 the usual things that when you own something, you have to. So there was a, a, quite a number of you who were working. Yes, there were. There were quite a few of us from Vesper George who were in that. Remember the World War II veterans were getting out and they were, they were hard to learn as much as they could. And Henshi, you see, Henshi was the only one most of us had even known or heard about, who was teaching something about how to put down what you see, which he calls, of course, Impressionist painting. And it came through the tradition of Charles Hawthorne. Charles Hawthorne started a class there in the uh, early part of the 20th century and continued on with that class until his death in, I believe, 1926. And Henshi at that time was one of his early assistants and eventually took the school over, called the Cape School of Art. He was a vivid personality. He was an oddball. He was, how would you put it? He was what, he's sort of a 1930-ish version of what you think an artist should be. Eccentric, bright, committed, uh, commanding, and sort of wrong-headed in many ways, and very obvious ways. I said earlier, he was a Fabian socialist, and that was certainly a little bit out of, out of style by the 1950s. And, and also the Hayes Diet, which he just poured the crap out of, was talking about how you should use it because you will restore your health. But in the meantime, on Saturday morning, when he criticized all the students, of which there were between 35 and 45 at any given time, in the studio, we'd bring our work in and he would remember what each one of us did the previous week and the week prior to that without having it there. So his, his criticisms, evaluations, were extremely on the ball, we all felt. And there was a sense of, therefore, unity that was given to all of us that we were going mostly in the right direction, sometimes a little better than other times and so forth, so that when you went out the following week, you had something to bite onto. He would be there every day when we were painting morning study and afternoon study. And in the evening, he'd be inviting us to go to the student studio to make drawings, and he'd be there drawing himself. So he only critiqued you once a week, but he was drawing... Oh, and no, he critiqued the whole once a week. He critiqued us twice a day throughout Monday through Friday. Sunday, we were off. One day a week, we were off. The rest of the time, we were... <coughs> and mind you, during that time, consider these fellows had been in the service for four years or so. They were anxious to get on with their lives and learn as much as they could. Uh, this was an intense... It was quite intense, and a lot of those men, particularly, went to the Art Students League during the wintertime, mm -hmm. and they studied with people like Frank Riley, he, you may not have heard of, but Frank was a remarkable teacher. He had a system. He had a system how to draw the figure, for instance. And it was, unfortunately, I, I felt, they all looked the same. I mean, it was a formula, and they all looked the same. But it was a good formula that could be used for illustration. And a lot of those men eventually did a lot of, oh, dust jackets for record things and uh, paper bo paperback books of various romances and so forth. And they did, did very well. But it was strictly within the realm of, of illustration. So the second year that I was there, Ives Gamble, this funny little man who lived next door in the studio that I told you I was in for about 17 years, uh, needed models because he was painting a mural for a bank in Providence, Rhode Island. And hell, we needed bread. We always needed it. Our students are always poor as all get out. So the whole bunch of us, Margie Osborne, who is now Mrs. John Wolf Jr., and myself and others posed for Ives, who was doing this 18th century costume piece in the middle of the summer. We had white wigs on and the whole thing. Jesus, enough to kill you. Uh, and at that time, this funny little man, I suddenly realized, was smart. He was supposed to be rich as Croesus, 
But the rumor was that he was, had the Procter and Gamble fortune. Of course, the name is spelled G-A-M-M-E-L-L. But anyway, it was half right. He was not po folk. And, but he worked seven days a week, and none of these goddamn artists that I'd met down there did any work at all. They talked about painting, as I am talking about painting, but they never got around to doing it. And, you know, I, I was impressed. I was really impressed. And he asked questions, serious questions about, so who are your favorite artists and why? And tell me about the pictures you know they did, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he would, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, and then he said, all right, here's two books. Read them when you can. In other words, by tomorrow when you come and post to me, I'll be asking you further questions. And I suddenly realized, Jesus, this guy is great. So the following year, 1950, he said, Bob, I have a studio available. He had a couple of studios in P-Town that he rented. And um, because Dick Lack had gone into the Korean conflict. Ah, and so Dick's disappearance made it available for me to be one of those students. And I think Bob Comey, uh, no, not Comey, Robert Homer Cumming, Bob Cumming was also there. Anyway, so I, I had a studio and studied with him beginning in 19, summer of 1950, then in the, it, the fall, winter, and spring in Boston at the Fenway Studio building where he had two studios, one student studio and his own. So I stayed for five years with Ives. Was he working in Williamstown in the summer? No, he had a place in P-Town. This is before Williamstown. Williamstown represented the last 17 years of his life. He lived to be 87. And prior to that, he, he went to P-Town to study with Charles Hawthorne, like in 1913, 14, something like that. And uh, he loved Provincetown. It was very difficult to get to, for very much the same reasons I did, too, actually. It was isolated. You, you went down and you didn't see any of these people from the big city <laughs> down there, you know. Your big city would be at Boston in this particular case. And it was truly a vacation as well, a, res a, a restoration of energy and all that sort of thing. It was just great. I still adore Pete's out. If I ever buy a place in the Cape, it won't be, no it won't be up Cape from Wellfleet, I assure you. It's going to be down further, preferably Truro, if there's any of Truro left as you probably know. <clears throat> but, you know, you asked me, for instance, did you ever meet any uh, famous artists? Well, I remember a Colonel McGee when I was there, probably in 1951, said, Bob, I think I, wouldn't, wouldn't you like to meet, uh, 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 what's his name, the, oh, come on, <laughs> uh, the famous artist at a studio in Truro, he's now dead, but he's, as famous as, as they get, as a kind of representational painter of Edward Harper. Oh. And I said, Edward Harper, my God, that would be great, but gee, are you sure? Because this Colonel McGee was a pushy kind of guy, and I thought, geez, I don't want him, you know, to get some situation where I'm, I'm this, it's not a, I shouldn't be. So he insisted, so we went up in his Jeep up to Edward Harper's house, and and he said, I'll be back in about an hour, said McGee. And I left me with this old man in his studio. And the guy didn't say one goddamn thing. I was in the studio. Well, you know what happens, because I am fairly garrulous. And I started talking, because he didn't. And I was just about ready to go out of my skin when finally Josephine, his wife, came in, who was very sweet and charming, and broke the ice. But that man was... Anyway, it, it was a vivid and very, very bad memory of Edward Harper. He just simply, I mean, almost as though he was both dumb and deaf, in a way, you know, and I don't know why he did that. I never could find out, because how can you ask questions about an experience like that? You simply can't. Um, it doesn't affect my appreciation of his work in, in any sense of the word, but Sometimes you meet people that are not as effective as you hoped they would be. And this was a perfect example of that kind of thing. Um, I'm, the name's Ogden Pleisner and... Um, uh, I didn't know Ogden Pleisner, but I know his work. Uh, Ernest Major? Ernest L. Major, yes. He taught at the Mass College of Art, which was the normal art school when he was there. And uh, he was a very fine teacher. 
I mean, a remarkably fine teacher. And how do you know? You know, because he's had very fine students. Mm -hmm. That's always the way. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, uh, but he was a bit of a showman also. And, you know, he was, he had a great cloak, and he always had a dog with him, and he was always talking about Dergas. Why he called Dergas? Dergas, I don't know. But he, that's, I mean, those are little things that you remember. And I did not study with him, had not studied with him, but he was at the Fenway Studio building, and he had a series of people who had studied with him, and some who were still studying with him at the Fenway Studio building. And, um, but he was a leading, no question about it, a leading teacher. But, you know, like all of us human beings, he had his limitations. One, I think, resulted in the fact he had married when he was fairly young, a very beautiful woman. I know this because I inherited the picture by, painted by William Paxton of Mrs. Ernest L. Major. And uh, she couldn't bear him. He got the hell out when she was very young. And he always seemed to have, so I've been told, by infinite number of students of his females that I have known over the years, that he was perfectly awful to his female students. Isn't that terrible? And yet, not so awful that they didn't get a great deal from him and, and had a kind of respect sometimes, because that was an era when a lot of painters of that age and older had this enormous sense, the students, we all had an enormous sense of respect, whether it's earned or not, for them simply because they were, really. And of course, that has all fallen by the wayside from 1950 on. That is, when Ives was trying to get students, for instance, and people would say, who the hell is he? You know, if he didn't have some kind of an extraordinary reputation, then, you know, I don't want to study with some guy who was, who was a nobody. And because he was working representationally, and because he was trying, he, Ives Gamble, was trying to recover something of the lost traditions that may be helpful to a younger generation, then it was very difficult for him. He just didn't have a, a big reputation in in terms of publicity, in terms of museums, in terms of the things that normally have counted and always will count for a long, have for a long period of time. So uh, unless a person got to know him and have a sense of appreciation for his incredible knowledge, really, it was ext extraordinary. You know, you both have read Twilight of Pain. And so you, I think, is probably the most concise uh, evaluation of what happened in education from the 19th century into the 20th century, the decline of sound education. And it is massively written and very concise, seems to me. Maybe it's a tribute partly to his education at Broughton School. Uh, but you have to read it. And you know, an awful lot of my age group, kids in my age group when I was young, who literally didn't read, mm -hmm. and they couldn't digest what he was talking about. And it was, it was a shame, because they had natural gifts. Good Lord gave them an ability to do something without knowing how. And that can be a tragic flaw, if that's all that's there. And has been a real problem amongst painters for many, many many generations, I think. Ability to be able to draw without knowing how. Sometimes they're uneducable. And if you have to struggle with something a little bit, it may be it will come and become, you, you'll be served by it in being, instead of you're serving it. When, when you, um, you've been, had a lot of training before you, you met Gamble. Uh, what, what kind of things did you do with him? Did he make you start with cast iron? Oh, that's a good. Now he said, all right, now Bob, you're going to start from scratch. And I said, well, fine. I have nothing <laughs> much to, <laughs> to bring to the plate right now, so why not scratch, start from scratch? Figure drawing, that is full size in a large paper. Paint, uh, drawing sight size, which you are familiar with. So that, and, and then coupled with that during the wintertime, painting still lives and working first in black and white or ochre, you know, something non-colored, monochromatic, 
so that you see values correctly, which I think is a very good. That has been kind of lost sight of, I think, recently, to work monochromatically. But working sight size, of all the things anyone has ever taught me in my entire life, the most revealing and helpful has been working sight size. This is working sight size, as you know. So you're standing far enough back from it so you can see the totality of nature at one glance, nature being in nature, not the painting. And you can glance at your rendition of this quickly from where you're standing observing and you can, anyone can see the thing that is least correct. And you try to make that better. And you try to make it better. And then one day you come in and you find you can't make it better, therefore it's done. I mean, that's the theory literally. And it helps you with your designing. It keeps you away from the goddamn painting. It means that you're seeing this thing as your spectator will eventually see it as well. And it has all kinds of virtues. That to me was, it was lost sight of through art schools because art schools became too crowded and they couldn't teach this method. That's what happened. And Sajan, for instance, as an example of an extraordinarily well-known person who was a remarkable painter, painted sight size. And so did all of his contemporaries. They learned this in their schools. But it had been lost sight of. And that was, to me, probably the most revealing thing, is working sight size. Now, there were other things, obviously, that, that came into play. Uh, I was never a, a natural draftsman, for instance, as some people are. And I had to work my ass off in order to get the thing correct, much less sensitive. You know, it was a struggle to do that. And so it has never been my forte. My forte, or natural bent, probably was for design and, uh, and color, uh, introducing various color relationships. But that was probably the, the, one of the most important things. But also I felt it was important to make available tickets to symphony, trips to New York or Washington, and other means of developing the student beyond working in the studio. And those were very, and some of us, including myself, were sent to Europe for three months, courtesy of Ives Gamble. And that was part of the procedure, the process of training. That may come as a revelation to you. Yes. And that was what he believed was, was necessary. And not everyone, of course, was offered that opportunity. But if you stayed there long enough so that you felt... And I found that Ives had a wonderful sense of humor. Most of the students were afraid of him, unfortunately. They, they had... He cowered. I mean, he was a bit of a bully. To be perfectly blunt, he was a bit of a bully if he could get away with it. With some of us, he simply couldn't get away with it. Were you older than a lot of the students at the time? No, I wasn't older. Not at the time, no. Mm -hmm. Bob Cumming and I were the same age. Dick Lack is about four days younger than I am. Uh, Bob Cormier, who'd studied with him, was several, well, maybe three or four years younger. So we were all about the same age. You just got along well. Yeah, it just happened to be that we hit it off. And I was happy to go to P-Town in the summertime when he loved going there. And I had this perfectly good studio that I worked in that he'd rented. Mm -hmm. And I'd drive his car. I had to learn how to drive at 25 because I never learned to drive. And so I had to. I always took the choo-choo train everywhere, you know. Um, so it, it, it just so happened that it worked out very well. And I was basically very fond, fond of him, even though I knew, oh, if I'd go to a museum with him, he'd be screaming about the goddamn lighting, and he would be nothing but complain, complain, complain. And, you say, and his voice was as loud as he was small. It would penetrate into all rooms all over the place. And you go, you have lunch with him at a Hojo's, let's say, on your way to the Cape, and he would, he would say, I'm on Welsh rabbit! And, but we don't have Welsh rabbit on the menu. Why don't you have Welsh and, I mean, you, you say to yourself, oh God, I hope no one's looking in our direction, but they probably are, wondering what the hell this funny little old man is all about. So there were, you know, eccentricity, little mannerisms that he had 
that one had to sort of tolerate. But it was worth it, in my view, very much worth it. Did he talk about his uh, feelings about being on the sort of artistic outs at the time? Of his? It must have been very difficult. For well, him. I think the difficulty occurred when he was so much younger before I knew him, when he was almost sure to be a National Academician. And he was rejected by the wave of jurors who were at the National Academy at the time who were opposed to anything to do with Boston because, let's face it, those Bostonians who came before him, Benson, Tavo, Paxton, DeCamp, etc., as fine as they were, they were arrogant as all get out. They were extremely arrogant. And they treated the New York painters as though they were second class, which was unfortunate. I'm talking about Lux, Glackens, Henry and Company, the so-called Eight, <coughs> and the Ashcan School. So they were, I mean, how <laughs> one does build a resentment when you've been looked down upon by somebody, I would think. It seems like, I mean, human nature is human nature. And it was, it was kind of too bad, because it, I was a wave beyond it. He was younger then. So he met a fairly hostile world in New York. And fortunately, as you know, he had a private income. So it, it meant that he, he didn't have to worry about where his breakfast is coming the following day. But even so, remember his real passion in painting was for allegorical painting. And that was about as lacking in current interest as is possible. It was just abhorrent to most people who did really care about painting. But he did care about it. And his Hound of Heaven series, which was based on Francis Thompson's Hound of Heaven, but extended beyond that and through it and around it, and went back to cultural events, uh, spiritual events, uh, attitudes that, that occurred before the, the um, long before the, the uh, Judeo-Christian tradition. And he would include some of those symbols and so forth in order to suggest that the human condition has not changed. As I remember Elmer Phelps, a history teacher of mine at English High School, would say, boys, history changes, but human nature doesn't. And you know, it, to me, that sound, it was a very sound kind of, just looking at that yearbook, see Elmer Phelps and remembering his comment about that. Um, so yes, he, he had his, you might say, reasons for being bitter, but he was never really twisted. There's quite a difference between bitter being bitter and twisted and just being a little bitter. He was never twisted because he was always in command. He had a very keen brain, for one thing. It always helps when your intellect is, is good. You could overcome an awful lot by using your, your brain intelligently and also being able to see things and in an historic perspective. And I think within the framework of those two elements that went into his being, that he was a very, therefore, a very sound teacher at a time when nothing, nothing was going on that any of us knew about, that even began to be sound. So we were indebted. He really was the only one. Well, you have Pietro Aragoni in, in Italy also. He taught, but I mean, that was Italy and most of his students were Italian. And he had uh, some wealthy Americans who'd studied with him too, like Nelson White's son, Beeb. Uh, but essentially, it was a world apart, you know. And uh, as far as I know, even today, during that period of time, there were still painters left who painted rather good pictures, but they didn't take, they didn't, they were not interested in teaching. You would take Sargent, for instance. People, I know people who said I'd study with Sargent. And come to find out, Sargent came by one day and saw they were, said, young man, you're going to go places. I mean, he just flattered the hell out of him. And that's not teaching, as you know. As far as I know, he didn't teach at all. I remember that uh, Boyd, uh, what's it, Edward Dolly Boyd, where they were very close friends, of course, Edward Dolly Boyd's children were painted by Sargent when he was in his mid-twenties, the Boyd children. And they were in 
Europe, in Italy, somewhere in Italy, and the two of them, Edward Dolly Boat was an architect, by the way, and, and architects of that period usually drew well. They had to. And he drew remarkably well, certainly by today's standards anyway. And he and Sarge were out painting watercolor. And he spent an hour and he thought, well, I'm not quite through. I'm going to see how John's doing. He went over to see how John Sarge was doing. And John just had a couple of lines down. That was it. <coughs> well, he went back and finished his so good. Well, none of it ruined it the next half hour. Came back and saw Sargent had completed his. Which is, again, a form of teaching, but to a friend. And it was a very indirect manner of teaching which would call for a bright person to understand what the hell went on between when he first saw it and last saw it. You've got to have knowledge in order to be able to evaluate something of that sort. But no, I don't think he, I don't believe he did. There was a Waldro Murray, <coughs> pardon me, Frank Waldro Murray, who'd studied with Sargent too, he claimed. He taught at one of the schools in Boston back in the 50s and, and early 60s. Do you, did, does that name ring a bell? I knew him. One time, a whole bunch of us who were teaching in art schools had to take some kind of courses that the Commonwealth offered so that we could really learn to teach, even though we've been teaching for years. But, you know, it was a requirement. And Frank Walter <laughs> Murray, who was, hey, had to be 30 years my senior, was one of those people who came to that class. He was a charming and delightful person. But he claimed that he'd studied with, with Sargent, and, and I don't, I wonder. He's the only one I know who painted really amazingly well. Who, where can you see his work? St. Botolph Club has one example of his work, Frank Walter Murray. <laughs> uh, Let Thompson, you've heard of Let Thompson, you know Let, Leslie. I met Leslie Thompson through Oz. And he lived in one of the Newtons, I think it was Newton Highlands, uh, up at a house somewhere. And I went and saw him, and he had a still life set up. It was all boxed off. The first time I'd seen that kind of device. And uh, I don't he may have had it up there for years. I'm not, sometimes, I suspect it had been up there for years. And, but there he was. You know, and I was so you, you say to yourself, and you, and all he said to me is, Bob, you've got to go to New York. Get the hell out of Boston. You can't make a living here. And you know, there again, the painters are interested in economics as well as painting. And I'm surprised at how economics seems to enter the picture more than one suspects it might. <coughs> because since the 19th century, as you know, and the La Bohème and all that is supposed to be struggling and, you know, it's wonderful to struggle. Bullshit, there's nobody I know. No one I know who would rather be rich, would, would, would rather be poor than rich. I don't know anyone if it had the choice between the two. And there is that element, it's a human nature to want to be successful. And it's measured certainly not only today, but forever by how much we are worth in terms of cash or gold. Think and we've it's all true. As artists, uh, and how do you do it? For instance, you've got to be flexible. How do you do it? I mean, for instance, how did I? I'm, I have come from a relatively humble background. <coughs> I've always paid my own bills. And how do I do? How did I do it when I was younger? I taught. I worked for a restorer like two days a week, and I struggled. I didn't get married until I was forty. We didn't have children until I was well beyond fifty. And so at that time that these two major events in my life occurred, I could afford to be in that position. You can't have everything yesterday. Yeah. You mentioned Pietro Anagoni. Um, and Anagoni's teaching, um, <coughs> I had met some of his students, it was very indirect kind of painting. That there was a lot of under, a lot of glazing. And That's painting. right. Not at all. Can you describe sort of the differences? Well, suppose he, suppose he were coming up to, to you on, on this, or a beginning of a painting. What would he say to you? What would be the thing? Gamble? Yeah. Mind you, he was a short man. He'd get his equalizer out. That would be a footstool, as you know. You've heard these stories, I'm sure. And he'd stand up and look at it and say, God damn it, Bob, you don't see the big look of nature. Then he'd take a brush out 
and said, I'll show you. Clean off that pallet first. I'll show you what I mean. And he'd show you. And he put these strokes of, of color down, <coughs> of paint down in, in what seems like an almost callous manner. And yet, it was so much more correct in terms of the big look than anything I had done, which was wiggly, wobbly, timid, and lacking in forcefulness, and lacking in that essential truth of the big look of nature. He knew it, and he did it. And that's how he taught, by example. Antigone, I don't know how he taught. I knew Antigone. I met him in Florence many, 40 years ago or so, when he was working on a picture for one of the English cathedrals. And uh, they had lunch with him and so forth, because I knew Nelson White. And anyway, that's, and he was just such a grand man. He was so important that people would, were in the studio from 12 o'clock on. How he could stand it, I'll never know. And then he'd bring them out to a, uh, to a place and they'd have lunch that would go on for two hours, at least two hours. And he was the big man, he was the big Pietro, the maestro, the maestro. And kind of, if you know what I mean, you must know what I mean. And but what kind of teaching he did, I don't know. But he studied with a woman whose name was Madame Simi. You may have heard of her, Madame Simi. Now, Madame Simi's father was a very, very fine painter of that group, and I forgot what they're called in Italian, but they're a group of landscape painters of the 19th, late 19th century. You see their work at the, um, uh, not the Uffizi, the, what's the other museum in Florence? The, no, the Uffizi, in fact. You see their work at the Uffizi. And he was Federico, see, Federico Simi was his name. He was a very fine painter. Madame Simi <laughs> taught drawing. And she lived to be 90 plus. And one day the students came into the studio and Madame Simi was there <laughs> and she had passed on. Frozen in time. <laughs> That's the story, anyway. But Madame Simi overmodeled things. And so did Pietro Anagoni. And so do most of his students. They're overmodeled. I have a, a drawing I want to show you later on that Henry did, Henry Henschy did of me, that is wonderful characterization of, of me at age, I don't know, mid 20s or thereabouts. Uh, but it's overmodeled. Gamble's oh, whole senses make it either in light or in shadow. Try to have as little half tone as possible, which is the way we see. If you look at a Titian, a great Titian is never overmodeled. A great Velasquez is never overmodeled. It's either in light or in shadow, in light or in shadow. Same thing is true of of all the great painters, even Veronese, who is a decorative painter, essentially, you'll find the same thing is true. It's either in light or in shadow. And I think the weakness of Antigone's teaching, which came through Madame Simi, I'm sure, was because, mind you, he'd studied with Madame Simi, amongst other people. But she was an extremely important influence on his life. And I don't know anything about their, their interpersonal relationships, but he obviously adored her and was very, you know, um, believed that, that she was instrumental in his, his own development. By the way, one of his most important pictures of, is of Elizabeth II II of England. It's in the Fishmongers Union building in London. And it's probably, possibly, one of the most extraordinary official pictures of, you know, people of that kind of celebrity that's been done in the 20th century, I think. Wonderful, wonderful. He painted uh, our governor Volpe in Boston, the official portrait. In fact, oddly enough, we, we had <laughs> lunch at a Hayes and Bickford, he and I and Bob Gummy together, <coughs> that very day that he was finishing it up. And we came back to the Fenway Studio building and Reggie, the black fellow that read said, the president's been shot. It was the day that, that uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. Whatever year that was, I forgot now. But we retired to our various studios, and that was the end. That's the last time I saw Anagoni, in fact. But he was, a, he was an important man. He was a wonderful artist, a wonderful painter.
but I don't think he took any of his painting. He didn't have the analytical mind that I've said. Damn it, having an analytical mind is, a, is an important asset to a teacher. He was a great teacher, Ives, I believe. And, you know, he was not a perfect man, but do any of us know anyone who's perfect? No. We all have our limitations, our little idiosyncrasies and so forth. And he surely had his. And he didn't try to hide them, I'll tell you. Looking back, what were some of, some of the um, lessons or, or um, ideas that Gamble taught that maybe you have over the years decided uh, didn't work for you or? Well, he was, he was interested in imagined the painting, which I tried in a funny sort of way. But I, I, I was not, I have one imagine the painting there's a photograph of up here, up on top of my desk. I did a mural, no, no, over here, on top of the desk, it's a photograph of a mural I did for St. Mary of the Harbor in Provincetown, a little Episcopal church on the Cape in P-Town. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, <laughs> the clergyman at the time said, I think we got to fill that wall, the west wall with a painting wall, what do you say? And I said, yeah, well, I'll tell you what. If you can get this funded, then we, we can talk further about it. I mean, you've got to be blunt about this. I'm not going to do something for nothing. So anyway, the, the gal that finally became his wife, who was rich as creases, decided she would be glad to fund it. So, I mean, these things have to be set in place. Then I knew perfectly well I had to bring the sketch to the so-called vestry, which is the governing body of this church, for approval or not. And also, if it got the approval, to have a written letter that it not only had the approval, but if at any time in the future they want to get rid of it, I have first refusal. You have to cover your ass at all these things. Otherwise, they'll whitewash the thing out when it is no longer fashionable. Well, it so happens it was painted in 1956, and it's still there on the west wall of St. Mary of the Harbor, right up above the Frederick Wall, Madonna and Child. Did you, you know Frederick Waugh was an Anglican. He was an Anglo-Catholic. And uh, so he brought that tendency into St. Mary of the Harbor. When he formed the church, basically, as a lay person. He was instrumental in forming that church, which is so-called outermost church. And he had all these friends who were either non-religious or belonged to different sects who gave him things to elaborate the church. It was a wonderful place in the sense that the artist had given, to, again, the artist had given too. By the way, this money that I was talking about for that only covered my expenses because it took me a year to do this thing. But that was an experiment in, uh, in a real job of doing a mural. And it's huge. It's really very large. It fits the whole rear wall, or the west wall of the church. Did you do more? No, I was never engaged to. I mean, I, I'm not going to do something like that unless somebody pays me for it. And, you know, at that, that was a time when everyone who was doing decorative pieces, they were either using mosaic or other materials, and architects were not interested in the painted version of these things. And I didn't pursue it, but it gave me a chance to do something that was eminently decorative, I thought. It stayed on the wall. Not like a Roscoe up at Dartmouth where they jump all over the place. It stayed on the wall. It, was, it met its architectonic requirement in this little parish. And that to me was, was a struggle to be able to, to, to make it work from the point of view of forget what it described. That it, looked, that it stayed on the wall and enhanced the character of the architecture, which I do believe it does. Yeah, I tried that, and you know, but then I started doing easel pictures because A, I could get them out. There was a demand for, demand for them. Remember when I was ki a kid, 25, 26, people would look at me when they first met me and say, I know your work, I, you, I thought you were 80. Because nothing like that was being done back in the 50s and early 60s, nothing was. With the exception of, on occasion, you know. So it was a great time to be getting started when you're the only one. So uh, that was something beyond my control, but I think it was an advantage that I had over people who were perhaps 20 to 30 years my junior, when there were more people who were involved in this. 
On the other hand, the more people involved, the more the competition, and competition is a good thing because it, you know, for a lot of people, it keeps them on, on their toes. If you have no competition, you get lazy because human nature is, hey, you'd rather sit in your ass than do anything else. And so it goes. Have I skirted around too much and not no, no, been no, as no, direct no, as I, I should be? What you were talking about, this, this independent light or shadow? Yeah. Because um, I had heard of something that Gamow used to say, and he'd say, paint the mask, like if you're painting a portrait, meaning paint, it, paint the entire light side over to the shadow edge yeah. as a whole piece of light. Mm -hmm. and sort of not let it all get broken up into a million half -tones. That's right. But then Sargent used to say, too, he'd say, paint out of the half tone. No, but no, Sargent did not paint in the same way as that Boston school. What, what Gamel was reflecting came historically from Tabo, Benson, Paxton. And that was a different tradition than the tradition of John Sargent, who worked from the middle tone out to the light and to the dark. I'm not saying one was better than the other, but let's remember there are different ways of working. And Gamble's way of working, he almost, I think, stressed some, I even talk about the bed bug line. Right. When a bed, bed bug crossed the bed bug line, he would no longer see his shadow. And it's a silly kind of way of putting it. But, uh, and again, you can see the truth of that revealed, not so much in Sargent, but you can, but in Velasquez and in uh, Carlos Duran, a whole bunch of painters. Who, whose work, finest work, exemplifies the advantage to making sure that the darkest tone in the light is lighter than the lightest tone in the dark. You've heard that. Yeah. There are eight ways of putting it. And keep it flat, flat as your hat. I don't, never did, uh, Richard Whitney is talking about that all the time. I never could understand quite what he meant by that. But to discern the difference, the major mask difference between that which is in light and that which is in shadow. And to continually go back to it. Because in subsequent operations, particularly if you're doing a portrait where you have the issue of personalities involved, you're apt to lose the big look, the big smash of light and shade. And you must come back to it. Sometimes it means painting it out and painting it in again. And another I found as a teacher over the years, it's easy to get people to understand these things intellectually, but difficult to get them to practice it. And to get somebody, uh, students of mine will say, but isn't it, it looks pretty good to me, Mr. Hunter. And I'll say, it's not good enough. And not good enough is not good enough. Now, the only way to do it is to have the courage to paint it out and paint it in again. And to get people to have the courage to paint it out and paint it again, I have found extremely difficult with many, many people. They're timid about that. They're afraid they're going to lose. And in all truth, if you have the courage to do it, it will, not might, it will be better the next time. And it's been proven. But it's hard for some people to digest and practice that. It will be better. Yeah, did you want to talk more about the actual technique of a portrait? If we could pause for a minute. Yeah. We actually have used an hour of tape. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, maybe God. now's a good time to start and to um, well, really more like technical. Hmm? Would you like something to drink? No, but I, I have plenty of, uh, I have coffee out there. No, it's just whether you would uh, like to No, I'm, my throat is not dry. Okay. So I say I gave up drinking 22 years ago. <laughs> Also, you know, you take criticism from whence it comes. And, and, Jason. and Jason, I mean, he's a young guy, and he's been brain, shall I say, brainwashed. Yeah. Maybe I'm br trying to brainwash people, too. I'm never sure. Yeah. But I think there's more substance to what I have to say. Right. 
than what Jason. I mean, Jason had a show at the same Botov Club not too long ago, which I'm sorry to say I didn't see. But I read his oddest statement. Well, those goddamned oddest statements that are written today is enough to gag a maggot. I mean, they're just so bizarre and so pretentious. Yeah. And as was his. Yeah. I don't, unfortunately, I didn't save it. And I thought, oh, Jason, come on, guy, really. Yeah. Do you really believe in what you are writing? It was just, you know, yeah. pretension. Ego. Uh, but you know, no matter who you are as a painter, you're not going to satisfy everybody. Right. You've got to find your audience. Yeah. And that's the thing, you have, must find your audience. And it's, I know no one ever said it's going to be easy. And it helps to have a lot of energy. And it helps to be cold-blooded, warm-hearted, but cold-blooded about everything. And that's hard to do, you know, it's sometimes hard to do. Because all of us, I don't care how sure-footed a person is, we all have our Achilles tendon when it comes to our own uh, psyche. Yeah, right. And it's very easy to damage that psyche when somebody lashes into you. Yeah. But, you know, it takes time to do those things. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, after all, you go to an art school, allegedly, or study with somebody because you want to learn your language. You know, we're, we're communicators. You want to learn your language. You're not just painting these things for yourself. You're painting these things because you care about what you're doing and you hope to convey that to as broad an audience as possible. The deeper and richer your language as a writer, the more able you are to communicate to a broader group of people. And the same thing is true about painting. If you know your language well, you'll be able to convey more than if you are limited in it. This certainly has been true about a number of painters who were at that cusp when the education was not that good, and yet you knew by looking at their work they had extraordinary natural abilities. Henry is a perfect example, I think, Robert Henry. He, and he was a great teacher apparently, but he never did master form. He was always the quick sketch artist, and that was it. And it, we couldn't go further than that. And of course, the worst of his stuff just falls apart. Maybe he drank, I don't know. But whatever happened, he, he, didn't, he was out of control much of the time. And admittedly, the best of his work is quite extraordinary. But the best is a very, very few pieces, I believe. I'm, and I'm quite familiar with his work. Certainly, William Merritt Chase is an extraordinary, first-rate example of a guy who is together all the time. <clears throat> I've never seen anything from his brush that is bad. I've seen things that may be a little inferior, but that's not bad. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot has to do with, of course, the training, but also what makes the person, the person aside from their training, which none of us have any control, much control over, I'm afraid. Anyway, did you want me to go ahead now and do something about this picture? Um, tell me where you'd like me to stand so that... Well, you, in other words, uh, I've got the whole scene here, so you're in the picture. Oh, you oh, really? Right now, in other words, so you can move across. The only thing to watch out for is the uh, mic cable as you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'll try and stay in more or less one place. More gaff tape. This time it's you, though. Well, this is an example of a finished painting that is set up right alongside of nature, which is very rare for me to, to keep nature up this long since I'm through with the painting. But it also gives me an opportunity to reflect upon what went through my mind when I started with nothing. 
It just so happened that I wanted to do a painting approximately this size. So forget the painting for the moment. <clears throat> Looking at nature itself, I grabbed this great polished brass unit and plunked it down because I knew I wanted that as a center of interest. Then I started looking at things in the studio that would be subordinate to it, so that you have an emphatic note more or less centrally located, and you have subordination surrounding it that also add rhythm that will lead the eye from one area in the canvas to another area in the canvas and not allow it to go out totally without it being returned again. Now since I started with that bright uh, <coughs> brass piece, I happened to have a nice little ironstone bowl and I thought by putting it in there and having it in a half light, it would be subordinate. That brown, brownish metal jug on the other side, which is put inside a white, again, ironstone plate, uh, would add a different level, as you can see. There is no level that comes quite to the top of that in the other units. The pewter mug here, a pitcher, a small pitcher here, is again higher in its note. And it also is, to in the totality of it, it's lighter in value although more intriguing in terms of its shape, more demanding. But since it's lighter, it is not too demanding. This is what goes through my mind as I try to make the analysis. The sumac, which I often use because it's cheap, and it grows every year, and I can get new sumac every autumn. And I put that up, and I use that as what I call filler. And who cares what it is? It's the, man it's the shape, the pattern, the darkness of it, the silhouette that happens to help unite things often, which otherwise they may not be united in this particular case. Now I've got two red apples and one orange. Of the three, of the three units, it is the orange that the strongest color note, and hence that is put in front of the bowl, and it has its reflection into the brass unit, and so therefore it's, it's kind of keeps it from being just an isolated one note. That's another thing. This odd color here, this kind of greeny note, there's nothing like it else in the whole composition. It's what I call the odd note, the odd color note, the unexpected, to keep it from being, I hope, commonplace, to add that odd note to it. And it's a small piece, but because of its location, it becomes central to the composition. And the three shells that are in it, one overlapping the other, as we all know, three, five, seven, nine is better than two, four, six, eight in anything. Because you want to avoid a duality of interest. You want to avoid, if you had, for instance, just two shells there, let's say this one was removed, then you'd have a duality of interest. You want to avoid that. Now, intuitively, you know this is true, and as you have designed over many, many, many years, you see those problems when you put them up, and so you make those changes. Uh, I don't know what else to say. Then you set it up. Then I decide with my viewfinder how much I want to include. After I make that decision by using a ruler and figure out, ha, I want that to be, let's say, 40 inches, I want this to be 24 inches, I buy the canvas, stretch the canvas, put it up, then stand back, looking at it sight size from where I'm painting, which is far enough back from the arrangement and the canvas, so that I can see the totality of nature with minor peripheral vision. Then I look and I say, what is the thing that is least like the white canvas? Why, it's the darker note. So I splash in whatever the shape is, like these sumac, as a dark and all, vroom, 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 lay it in, approximating it, not dealing with the detail of the exact silhouette, but approximating it, and making it probably a little larger than I want it to be. So that ultimately, when I come to the adjacent note that is next to it, I'm able to work wet paint into wet paint, and control the edge and keep it softer than I want it to be. 
Hard edges are like Banquo's ghost. They will not down. They get more so and more so. It's the bane of fine painting. Too many edges. Keep it soft and loose. And only find it when you absolutely have to, is the answer, I think. But that has to do with observation and also trying to decide what you do and when you do it. If you always, as you're walking back and forth and only looking at nature from the point of view of where you're painting, looking objectively of all of nature, looking at the whole thing when you're deciding on the parts to make them better, notice that, notice that to make it better. You don't finish a painting. A painting will finish itself. We can all make something better in anything in life. But if we try to finish it, we're in trouble. So therefore, make it better. And it will finish itself. That has to do with designing. It has to do with rendering. It has to do with the observation of nature. Now, it's easy to say that. And I'd be the first to admit, through my own experience, it's a difficult thing to do with great sensitivity. And sometimes you're more effective than other times. Any questions about further about this? In designing, I, I can't think of what else I can say that would elucidate it any more effectively. At some point, do you go in and just finish one, or do you, do you work as much as you can on one, one object or one area? Or do you keep working in places all around the canvas? Well, therefore, you have to, for instance, let's say I've been working this four days, and I've got maybe another four. I'm midway through, and there's nothing worse in my experience, than being midway through a painting. It's the worst part. When you get started, it's fun. And when you're in the last couple of days, it's great fun. But in the middle, it's neither sixes nor sevens. It's, it doesn't hold together. There's, everything is wrong with it. And you begin to wonder, what the hell is the most difficult thing, the worst thing? Because it all looks bad to me. Get over it. And make sure you rely in your judgment as to what next to do by looking at the whole of nature, and looking at your interpretation, you will see, if you're objective, the thing that is least correct, and you can make it better. It sometimes means on the fourth day of an eight-day session, let's say, you have to paint out the area around the thing that is least correct, and bring wet paint over the edge, and then work on it. You have to prep it. You see what I mean? So you're always working wet paint into wet paint. And you're making your joint out here somewhere. You see? So naturally it means if you're working on a fairly large canvas, that one or two, maybe three of those days, you're just working on a passage. But that passage must be an interlocking of various shapes. Not just the thing itself. Because if you do just the thing itself, it'll get too edgy. You have to paint it out and paint it in. When you're working in this general air, uh, manner of a la prima, where you're trying to make it as much like as possible from the beginning, and you know through experience you can't make it very much like, or enough like, until several days have gone by. So you have to paint it out and paint it in. I can't emphasize that enough. In your start, how much are you going for brilliant color relationships in those first few? Days? I'm trying to make it as much like nature from the very start. It ain't very much like nature at the beginning, but I'm going in that direction. Getting the value and the hue and the color, in other words, and the shape as accurate as possible. So the first notes down, or the first brush strokes down on the canvas, you're thinking about value at that point? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You cannot ignore value. Are you going for your darkest values early on? Yes. So you're... you're because I'm working on a white canvas. I'm going for the thing that is least like you're canvas. You're making it as dark on that first I'm working on a gray canvas over there. Okay. You notice all my still, I mean, landscapes are gray-ish. Yeah. So therefore, I go for the lightest and the darkest. And then... It's surprising how, with just the stain sometimes, that tone works out really quite well as, until you finally put on the real note. So you're toning your landscape canvases ahead of time, but you're not toning your still. I'm not toning the still. I work on a white canvas to myself. 
There's nothing wrong with toning a canvas. But I work on a way, so much has to do with you, what you get used to, what you're comfortable with. I used to work on a white canvas because Henry said, you've got to have them white, 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 Henry Henry. But I decided it's too dazzling when you're working out outside with a white canvas. And I always work with, I don't happen to use an umbrella, but I work with the ca canvas set up so that the sunlight doesn't play on it. And I've got something in back of it, as you notice these canvases I have over there, they have cardboard on the back of them so the light doesn't show through. Very important. I mean, those are practical considerations, but they're important. And I work normally myself from uh, roughly 8.30 in the morning until 11, or maybe quarter of 11, because then the light changes. And if you're working impressionistically, and remember the definition of impressionism is when you look at all of nature and see all the parts in relationship to the whole visual experience. That's it by definition. Vermeer was an impressionist. I mean, we're not just talking about French impressionism, landscape painters of the 19th century. We're talking about either you're, as a painter of representation, you're either governed by your mind or your eye. Now, Vermeer was governed by his eye. Velasquez was governed by his eye. Chardin, <coughs> Chardin by his eye. <coughs> Michelangelo by his mind, Ang by his mind, and so it goes. And you get to Durga and you find that you've got a man who's governed by both. <laughs> I mean, that's what makes him so great, that he understood. He had a wonderful academic training before he became an innovator toward the middle and end of his life, doing these ballet things that are extraordinary. But it's, it's rare that you can become both until you are quite mature. <clears throat> so you're one or the other. And in our tradition that you and I and others have been taught, so-called Boston School, well, I loathe that name, by the way. I just, you know, it's such a nonsense name because what it really means, the Boston School, or a group of painters who have been dead for years. And they had Benson, Tabo, Paxton to Camp, and a whole bunch of gals who were superb painters, including Lillian Westcott Hale and many others. And they were the Boston School. And how, who, who dubbed them the Boston School, do you know? Ives Gamble did. There was no such word as the Boston School until Ives invented it in order to describe that group of painters. <coughs> and now these goddamn galleries all over the place are talking about Boston School this, Boston School that. And it, so the, the meaning has been distilled, certainly, has been watered down. And I just think the one thing we all have in common is that we, we like to make pictures look like what they look like. Right? Look like what they look like. Whether it's the emphasis on the academic aspect or on the impressionist aspect. And it's pretty hard to, to, to govern the two, make the two the same. One of the reasons that Ives' book, one of the illustrations in his book on Twilight of Painting that I think is particularly poignant is when he talks about uh, Sargent and, see, yeah, Sargent and, and uh, Ang uh, evolving from the slave girl in both cases, a picture that is remarkably similar one to the other. And yet Sargent was the impressionist and Ang was the acad academician. And yet, Ang understood color. He knew color, and he could use color. And Sargent could draw. <laughs> there you are. A combination of the two comes about pretty close to bringing a somewhat similar uh, visual statement. So most of us are governed by the two things, but the emphasis is on one or the other. And you asked me in your original question that you consider yourself an impressionist. I guess by nature I'm not, but by experience I am. And, but I'm certainly not an academic painter. I'm something in between. Because I don't draw anywhere well enough to be called an academic painter. <coughs> to come back to your setting up your stilla, um, you had mentioned earlier about something tall, something short, something shiny, something dull. Yeah, one. And I also wanted to know about your color relationship. Do you, do you actually think 
Um, I'm going to start with some big neutral colors. No, I don't, I don't think, you see. I'm, I'm talking now about in intuition. But in trying to analyze the intuition, I therefore select shapes that I interact, that interact with each other in terms of something big, something small, something skinny, something fat, something flat, something shiny, da, 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 so that you have a sense of variety in the shapes that you interrelate. But the shapes are not important until themselves, until they interrelate with other shapes in it. So you do push and fuss and withdraw and add and come back with a fresh eye and say, oh no, I'm going to take this out and put this in. So it may take you a couple of days before you have an arrangement you think is worthwhile painting. In my case, in almost every case, I put something up that I think has a quality of serenity about it. Now, is that because I think the serene is important in our world today? The answer is yes, I do. And sometimes they're better than other times, you know, like I'm human too. I've seen some of my paintings that are on other people's walls and I say, oh dear, if I could only have done that a little differently. But it's bound to be. But, you know, they like it. They paid the price. And so keep your nose out of it, Hunter. How many days, weeks did you spend on this one? This one here? Mm -hmm. Six, seven days, seven days. I don't know, but it's just bum, 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 bum. But you paint broadly. Always use the biggest brush for the job to be done. Keep away from your sables, if you possibly can. Can we take a look at some of the brushes? Yeah, I mean, I use these an awful lot, for instance, nowadays. Oh, this is nice. I mean, they're just synthetic br bristles. Yeah. And, you know, they wear out in due course, but if you keep them clean, surprising how long they last. And uh, others in this, I use this type of brush a lot. They can be per, uh, but the biggest brush for the job to be done is the answer. This brush I've used for varnishing for years, years. What do you use the, the wide fan brushes for? Oh, sometimes if I have a build up on an edge. Uh, or another thing, let me just tell you, uh, after the first three days, each day, I often put sheets of newspaper or sheets of an old telephone directory. I think it's underneath here. But I've got lots of them. Sheets of an old telephone directory. I'll take them off and put it right onto the canvas while it's wet. And let's assume this is wet. I'm through five hours of work, six hours of work. I'll put it on and press it down. Pull it off and leave an impression here. And I leave a nice tactile surface, which is like a coarse, somewhat coarse drawing paper. And that will also help dry it out more quickly. So in two days, I can work again on that. And I won't have to worry about a edge building up. This re essentially removes the physical edges. You don't want an edge until you're finally through with it. I don't use any. No. I just use turpentine. Oh, I, I have used in the past poppy oil, and, but I haven't recently. First place, it's hard to get. And the second place, I find it tends to be slick. Mm -hmm. I think slickness is something that has to be avoided at any price. There's nothing more offensive than something looks like it was made out of Vaseline. And we've all seen paintings like that. Uh, it's better to have it, if anything, a little on the rough side. But, I mean, that's, that's a minor distinction in a way. Your palette's a little bit different from the classic Gamma palette. That we well, I have yellow ochre, light red, Indian red. Now, since I'm going to be working on that this afternoon, I have cerulean blue and viridian and French ultra, and I always have ivory black. But my basic palette is white, yellow ochre, light red, Indian red, and ivory black. Then I add these secondary colors when I need them. Cerulean blue, viridian, and ultramarine blue. Cadmium yellow light in Rembrandt. Yeah, it's the only one that I only, I specify Rembrandt. So you don't use cadmium lemon? No, I mean, I don't. 
which is not to say one shouldn't. Mm -hmm. I don't. I find that is a spectrum yellow. And you can make it green or orange very easily, greenish orange. Whereas some yellows are just too dark. They're like a cadmium deep, and they're useless from my point of view. If you have cadmium orange, which is a very important color from my point of view, cadmium scarlet, and alizarin crimson. And that's it. So you've got clear colors on that side, you've got your muddier colors on that. Well, yeah, it's, you can uh, orchestrate a piano any, any way you want. You know, just so make sure the notes are always the same, so it simplifies life. And you can almost automatically go after a color without really looking at it. So you would allow an area to dry at least two days before you work back yeah. into it. You never work back the next day. Oh, I, if I use poppy oil, I, it's still wet the next day. If it's tacky, I don't. Well, you can. You know, you pick it up, and then you have a disturbing uh, business of of a surface that's unpleasant. And you stay away from sables. I stay away from sables as, as much as, I, as you see. I have no sables here to speak of. I mean, occasionally, for instance, I have this, this as an example, a couple of sables like that, which, if I'm painting, let's say a little straw, you know, one of those little, I may fum fum put it in this way. But again, the biggest brush for the job to be done, which also means a small brush for a small job. So that's, anyway, that's yes. a, a, essentially it. And, and at the very end, you're just using turpentine. I'm still using turpentine only. Mm -hmm. Now, when it dried, for instance, in this case, it dried in since I last painted on it. I take and spray on with a mouth atomizer A retouching varnish that I mix up, which is one part to ma to two parts turp. Shake it up and blow it on. Because all over or just the area you're going to work? No, I'll on a small canvas like this all over, yeah. Because you can't control it. I just sprayed this before you all came today. And uh, so that I know what needs to be changed. Otherwise you don't. What's the point of doing it over again if it's all right? Then when it's dry, I always use, and have for many years, Winton, uh, Wins Winsor & Newton Artist Gloss Varnish. And I put it on with my trusty old brush. Putting it on an angle and just brushing it on. If it's not dry, you're in trouble. It has to be dry. And I have occasionally been a little anxious to get varnish on. And then I have to cobble and dobble, and I will sometimes think, oh dear, this is not wise. But it does happen. Well, that's more than I think we thought we would, we would be able to do in, in one short morning. Well, it wasn't, I, I hope it wasn't too boring for the, all of you that, to have one person yakking away for what it seemed endlessly about all kinds of things. But I still, you know, I think so much has to do with, for the painter, to do anything in his or her power to reduce, reduce anxiety. Anything to reduce anxiety. Remember, it's just a goddamn painting. You're not giving birth to a child. <laughs> and some people, really, you'd swear, they were pregnant and they were, they were due. <laughs> and all they've done is been painting a picture. Well, they're exhausted, and you're exhausted if you're their teacher, believe me. Good. <laughs> or their student. Yeah. Oh. You had started to talk about that wonderful thing when you were saying, um, we were talking in the other room about um, you have your training, but then beyond that, there's something in a person, you know, that what, what makes a person paint and... Well, there, you know, there's a mystery in life, thank God, that not everything can be explained away in a rational way. I mean, there is a compulsion of some sort. A painter, a person who is a painter has to have a compulsion to paint. Why? I don't know. But I sense it. I've sensed it from the time I was a wee child and knew nothing. And I'd go down and we lived in Hyde Park at the time, and I'd pick up violets in the field and try to render the goddamn things in watercolor. Well, they're probably perfectly awful, but the fascination I had with it the sheer joy, even the smell of the pigment. I mean, I like the smell of the studio. I like everything about painting. Always have and still do. And that's part of it on, on a curious kind of 
instinctual level that, that is there, but how you can explain why you want to be an image maker as opposed to being a musician. And you asked me, what would I like to be if I were a painter, for instance? I have no idea. I toyed with the idea of being an actor, and I think that would be real fun. But I looked at the life when I was about 19 or 20 and realized you're dependent upon a whole bunch of other people if you're going to perform. I didn't like that because it meant you're out of control. You've got all kinds of other agencies that are involved in the development of your professional life. And the only life as a dancer, not that I ever really seriously wanted to be a dancer, but Christ, you're over at 35 or so or less. And you know, you figure, yeah, I'm probably going to live longer than that. So why not get involved in something where you have a long life? Titian lived to be in his 90s. And on the other hand, of course, uh, Dennis Miller Bunker died when he was 29. But so what? If he lived longer, he would have continued to paint, probably. Uh, so, I mean, I think the only thing that amused me at one time, because I was an amateur actor at one time. I used to love to be in, <clears throat> I was a quick study in plays, that sort of thing. So a guy is always called upon to do things like that. And uh, it was great fun, but I, I couldn't, I, I don't think there was anything else I ever really wanted to do. And this goes back to my extreme youth. And I th I, I'm not, for instance, who is there that we know who was sort of successful, if not very successful, who started painting when they were 40? Lilla Cabot Perry. There were very few, and you wonder sometimes about her success. And she certainly had the wherewithal to pay her own bills, regardless of what happened. Uh, but mostly people have a yearning for this, at least before the 19th century, before the 20th century, I mean. From the time they're very young, they may not be able to fulfill it, they may not be able to explore it because of other considerations in their life. <clears throat> but they've always wanted to do it. I have people in classes, like I teach four classes at the Hebrew Center here in Newton. Wonderful setup there, by the way. And they know how to pay the right amount of money for the instructor, thank God. Uh, and they're wonderful people. They've always thought of wanted to paint, but one was a doctor, one was a lawyer, one, and so forth. And they're men and women who are mature. You're not dealing with all these sexual anxieties that you have with the very young, which are so boring after a while. They really are, you know. And you don't have to deal with a lot of things that you do with young people. And it's just plain fun being with them, because you're with an equal, so to speak. And they do appreciate anything you can say or do or show them that is a little helpful. And I find it very stimulating. I've always loved teaching. Even when I was teaching a little bit longer than I have been of late. And I think it's the most wonderful thing to be able to help somebody else be what otherwise they may not be able to become. And that's great. And that has a lot to do with your attitude about life, doesn't it? Nothing to do with painting, necessarily. So anyway, that's it. Well, maybe what might be a good idea is to move into the other room and just maybe pick out one or two paintings that you feel are representative of great design, design that you've admired. And well, yeah, I suppose. We have, unless we have time to do all of it, but I'm not sure. Well, I mean, good God, it, it is one, almost 1 o'clock yeah. now. You've got to. Yeah. I, I'm free. I don't mean, but I don't want to hold anyone else up. I, well, I'm worried about these guys. Yeah. Um, can well, I think, I think, let's see how complex it is. Because okay. I mean, we, we, there's no light in there. Yeah. There was no light, no. No, it's impossible. Even if you throw on lights, it, it's, there's no light there. Yeah. It's, well, then maybe it's not. I think this will work yeah, probably a, pretty well. We've got an awful lot. lot. You have a lot Great material. stuff. <laughs> Very good material. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we've, you covered so much. I mean, you've got into really almost everything that I had wanted to talk about. You wanted you to talk about. I think we, we did. I, but I think, I think that one thing, of course, there are a lot of things that could be explored further sometime. Yeah. yeah. And I would, hopefully, I'm going to write sometime when mm -hmm. maybe if my eyes go or my legs finally go, then I can write something down about what I consider important in the life of a painter, mm -hmm. and it's his or her development, mm -hmm. or as they went the way through life, things that I have found bear serious consideration. 
But I think mostly it's, it's just being a decent human being, really. That's it. Yeah, I mean, I've run into so many talented people who are so goddamn self-centered. You, you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe a person could get that far and still be so super concerned about themselves and nothing or no one else. And uh, fortunately, you've had the advantage of Paul, who is super concerned about his field, about what he's doing, and about his training, and so forth. And so you've, you witness the opposite, in a way. Absolutely. But uh, it's too bad, you know. Mm -hmm. I was just listening to Cary Grant last night on, what is it called, the biography. It was an yeah. interesting, I always found him a very interesting person. Mm -hmm. And God, that man was quite extraordinary. He died at 84. He had a quick stroke and didn't wake up the next morning. I mean, what a way to go, huh? Yeah. You know, it's been wonderful for me because um, I've been with Paul so, so long and I was beginning to feel that maybe a lot of what Paul had taught me was more Paul and not so much Gamble and I was really good, kind of trying to figure out. But it was wonderful to hear you talk because... Reconfirming, wasn't yeah. it? Reconfirming, you, got, you say exactly. I mean, it was so... The whole thing is exactly as Paul has given us. To hear it again from you was just a wonderful, and to see how much it's influenced both of you. I mean, how, how much you both have kept it as a whole That's right. thing, That's too. Right. It's, it's just wonderful. No, and it's, um, and of course Paul had the <coughs> distinct advantage of being with us and directly. And, but I, I wonder, sometimes worry about when you say, what is the weakness in the Boston? Some of these Boston painters is, well, I hate to use the word taste because that's so personal. Mm -hmm. But the taste level of those Western people sometimes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from my point of view, is, is awful. <laughs> Who's that woman who's squeezing her breasts? What is she called? Uh, Rachel uh, having difficulty <laughs> producing milk? Oh, or something. Oh, that? <laughs> that's a and it's a wonderfully painted thing. Oh, it's either Levine or Jertsen. No, it's oh. Jertsen, Steve. Oh. It's Steve Jertsen. Well, Levine, uh, Levine's taste level is pretty high, I think. Yes, I've seen a lot of it. But there are some times when uh, I've been out there and I've seen these guys. Uh, one time I went out because Dick said, you've got to come out, Bob. So I went out to St. Paul and Minneapolis and, and met a whole bunch of them about hmm, 12 or 14 years ago. And Dick was still teaching at the time. And I went to Paul, uh, Steve Jerson's studio. He's a nice, nice man. And I saw some things he was working on. And there were passages that were... Bucaro-like. Yeah. And he's got a small little studio in his funny little house in the suburbs of Minneapolis. And you wonder how he ever does it, in a way. Yeah. But he does. But his stuff is essentially academic, and it's... Uh, can I move with this? I guess I can. Yep, you should be fine. <clears throat> Robert Hunter speaking. Oh, Phyllis, how are you? Fine, thanks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure, absolutely. So it's hot, good. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you for calling. I appreciate it. You too, dear. Bye. But, you know, talking about that, how do you make out? How do you make a living? You know, that's, we're all interested in that. I have about six galleries that handle my work. That was just one of them there. And any time you have in this case, there was a person who wants to commission me to do a still life. And so I said to this particular guy, have you been in touch with them? Sometimes you have to remind your dealers that a commitment might be made, you know, a commitment was made. But you have to be on top of your business. Mm -hmm. You have to keep good records, mm -hmm. as anyone does. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have to keep good records. You have to know where your work is. Mm -hmm. Many of my friends have no idea where their paintings are. They, they never did bother getting a, either a contract or, or even a... a Acknowledgement of receipt of works. 
Do Let's you get your galleries to give you a uh, list of who they sell them to? So can't always do that. Yeah, that's tricky. Can't always do that, because, and the problem is that a lot of painters are not particularly ethical. Mm -hmm. And they will call somebody who bought a painting in somebody's gallery and try to sell them another one. Mm -hmm. That's not ethical. Yeah. And how do you guarantee that somebody's going to be ethical? Mm -hmm. So you avoid giving, if you're running a gallery, giving away the addresses and so forth of your client, it's your clientele, mm -hmm. not the artist, necessarily. But if you were having a show and you want to get work back, you're dependent mm -hmm. on the gallery. Uh, well, absolutely. You, you hope that the gallery... You hope they're still there. You hope they're still there, and if they're not there, that they are business enough to have records. records yeah. yeah. And it means... So, look, look at it this way. It gives the future art historians something to work on. <laughs> if you do all the work for them, what's, what's the good? They're not going to be interested in doing their job. It's true. It is true. <laughs> but no, I've, I've had no trouble with galleries at all. I've had a very good working relationship. But you can't depend on one. Yeah. They'd like you to think you're, you're depending on them. Mm -hmm. And you don't push one against another. Oh, this is bad manners, mm -hmm. to say the least. But also, it's bad business. Mm -hmm. You treat them all as though they're special. So you've got Tree's Place and you've got Jay Todd. Jay Todd. Yeah. I have a gallery in California. Mm -hmm. And I have... Uh, Larry, who's yeah. always doing something for me, yeah. and he's a nice guy, and he and Kimberly are delightful people to work with, I found, yeah. Yeah. and I've been with them for years. Yeah. And, but you can't depend on one outlet any more than they can depend on you as being their, their only outlet as a painter. Okay. Do you find ever advertising in magazines is helpful? I don't do it because, it's A, it's too expensive, yeah. and I feel if a gallery wants to do it, then they can. Yeah. But I am not a great believer in advertising. Mm -hmm. I find that word of mouth does it. And if you get your work into a, for instance, Wellesley is, is a rich community. Mm -hmm. And the, mm -hmm. we're talking about, if you have paintings that go from 5000 to $20,000, you've got to be in an area where people can afford it. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, with out in Larry's part of the world, between Concord and Carlisle and other, there are a lot of nouveau Money, new, new money. You don't go after old money, you know. Anyone who does is crazy. Big houses. They're trying to get rid of it. They're trying to get rid of it. Yeah. Not their money, but their objects. And no, you want new money. And I also noticed that you don't put any kind of uh, uh, copyright anything. You're not. You're not. I used to. No, I used to. Uh, no, if anyone wants to do it, they can do it. I. I have a couple of places that <coughs> reproduce my work in California, yeah. <coughs> and they copyright themselves. Uh -huh. And I, years ago, I was in touch with the Donald Art Company, who did reproduced 20 of my paintings in two different sizes. This was back in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s. <coughs> and they're all over the world at that time in non-communist countries. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about no sign works. Thank you. I think that's phony baloney from the word go. I refuse to be involved in it. But I don't mind having my work reproduced <coughs> any more than Bonnet uh, would have minded having his work reproduced. But let's not call them signed prints, thank you. I think that is just awful. Because also it means that real printmakers, you're doing them bad, you're doing them ill by pretending these offset prints are that important. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I know that a lot of my younger friends don't agree with me on this, but I feel very strongly about it. Because mm -hmm. I think it's bad in the broader sense of getting non-painters to recognize the difference between a reproduction and an original. Mm -hmm. And there are, of course, there are original prints, you know, etchings and lithos and so forth, mm -hmm. but, but not reproductions of somebody's painting mm -hmm. that are signed 150 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To me, it's dishonest. Mm -hmm. And other people say, well, yeah, but it's how I make my money. I say, it's none of my business. But you ask my opinion, that's it. Yeah. It is just not right. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, getting back to how, so how do you make a living? I mean, you can teach, you can demonstrate. I have put on painting demonstrations for 50 years to every little goddamned art association in New England who wants me. And then you put on a show. 
actually, hopefully, it's a teaching demonstration. Mm -hmm. You show them how you go about what you're doing, how you do it, and why you do it, and the whole bit. And then you, they end up by, hopefully, feeling they've learned something. But to put it on as a magic show, again, is a form of dishonesty. Mm -hmm. That's not teaching. Mm -hmm. That's another ego trip. It's going to be quite different. But no, I think you can do all kinds of things. You can write, you can... Good God, I don't know. I just, you gals probably are not plagued by this. Oh. <laughs> no, well, you might be plagued by this immediate problem. I am, I'm supporting two kids. That are That's right. Mm -hmm. And it's... Uh, but you want to work more rapidly, I gather. I, th that's the trouble, is that I, I take so long on the things. I Does mean, Paul take a long time in his thing, too? I don't know, but I think, I think he also made us feel that it had to be so perfect that, that nothing was right, so you keep, you keep going over and over. And, and, which is what's so interesting about your work, because I think as, as we develop as professionals, you do start to learn that there's certain things that you're going for and other things you need to leave alone. And I think Paul certainly understands that and talks about that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. but I think as a student, you get this a different message, and you have to get beyond that sort of yeah. student oh, mentality. Oh, yes, that's right. That's and, right. And decide what's important to you. Mm -hmm. and, real, and as he said, you know, you get it and then you go home. You know, you, you, you work on it, you get it, and then that's it, you leave it alone. Yeah, but, you, you have to know when to you stop. Have to know but how to do that. I think that kind of anxiety that is, is a result of never getting through with something mm -hmm. is, is... Especially for a portrait for us. And it's, it's, bad, for, it's bad for you, and it's it bad is. for your nature, your very nature as well, mm -hmm. and your well-being. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that we never feel like we've, or we're never made to feel that we would ever get anything right, so you have to keep going back and back, and especially with portrait, especially with... I think it's more with portrait, I think, mean, flesh tones. Yeah, and yeah. 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 Uh, it's a trap. You're right, it, it is it a trap. Be, it can be.